Julia Mascani. Julia is also IDS and also research director at the International Center for Tax and Development. Julia. Thanks, Mick. Um, it's going to be a bit of a change of gear um, with my reflections. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Russian wealth uh, and the sanctions that are being applied to it. And I want to start with the fact uh, about Russian wealth, which is that it is highly concentrated at the top and a large portion of it is offshore. And we now have hard evidence on this, thanks to the work of economists like Gabriel Zuckman, Aneta Steder, Emmanuel Saez, they've been analyzing data for quite a few years now. And they've shown us, for example, that the share of offshore wealth over total wealth in Russia is much larger than in other countries like the UK, the US, France, or Spain. And equally, that wealth and income is concentrated amongst the richest 1%, a lot more than in many European countries. So in some way, this is uh, good news because uh, it means that one, when one goes out to sanction um, uh, Russian wealth, this is a relatively contained group of people um, and their wealth is largely held not in Russia where it would, where it would be a lot harder to, uh, to reach it with sanctions. So where is it? That wealth uh, for a large part is really in our own home. Um, it is in places like the UK. Uh, it, is, uh, it has been known for a long time that the UK is the haven of choice uh, for many Russian oligarchs. And I think it is important uh, to say that this wealth doesn't just happen to be in places like London. Places like London not only hosted it, but welcomed it, ensured protection for it and secrecy. And this is money that at a minimum is of incredibly dubious nature. Uh, if not outright dirty, corrupt, and possibly laundered in the UK. So if that is true, um, countries like the UK and other Western countries uh, haven't only been neutral observers in this process, um, they have been accomplices, and, they, and that needs to dictate the size of the response that we're now giving uh, to the war in Ukraine when it comes to uh, sanctions on um, rich uh, Russians in particular. Um, but also it should dictate the size of the response, you know, taking in a way, obviously the war is never an opportunity and this is a, absolutely a, a horrible war and there's horrible crimes being committed in Ukraine, but it can perhaps be an opportunity to tackle a problem that is uh, certainly a global problem uh, and, uh, and that was already there well before the war. And because it was already there before the war, is it doesn't only have to do with Russia. We know that uh, kleptocrats and their associates have been getting richer at the expense of ordinary people for many years and in many countries. So by all means, we should be treating this as a global problem, uh, but of course, with also the added urgency of uh, its benefit, uh, of the benefits that tackling it uh, can have for, uh, for the situation in Ukraine. So what is it that can be done? Uh, I certainly don't have time to go into the details of everything that can be done about this. Uh, I would point you to a, a great report by the uh, Tax Justice Network, uh, which I'm hoping somebody can um, uh, post in the chat. Um, the key point here on the what can be done question is that uh, we need to know where the wealth comes from. And if it is legitimate wealth, then it needs to be taxed appropriately. If it is not legitimate, then it needs to be prosecuted. We cannot uh, afford to have uh, money that is not uh, legitimate uh, in countries like the UK without questioning it and without investigating it, which is what has been happening uh, so far. In order to do all of that, you need to know who owns the assets and where those assets are. And this is incredibly difficult because, particularly because of secrecy jurisdictions, it's obviously a lot more complex than that but because of secrecy jurisdictions and the kind of uh, services they offer. That includes trusts, shell companies, uh, and the like. So the first thing to do here is certainly to lift secrecy. Uh, that can be done with uh, things like asset registries, uh, registries of beneficial ownership, but also in general, a lot more transparency over who is linked to those entities that are so problematic. I think it's important to say here that any national legislation is very unlikely to succeed unless it brings in those secrecy jurisdictions. And many of those are linked to uh, the UK, for example. So you have UK Crown dependencies and overseas territories playing a very important role here. So in a way, the UK is, a, is in a really good position to actually tackle this uh, issue as a leader if, uh, if that is uh, indeed the policy desire. 
But aside from uh, addressing secrecy, uh, one can also make use of existing data to track transactions. And one of the good things about the time we live in is that all of this data is digitized. I'm an economist, I work with this kind of data and, uh, and it can be analyzed uh, in ways that can be useful in the current situation. For example, uh, banking data <clears throat> is in principle available and we can track the movements of money in recent weeks. If I was a Russian oligarch, I would have probably started moving my money around even before the war started when Russian troops were amassing at the border. So by looking through the banking, um, banking records, we can track down where the wealth has moved uh, and, and possibly uh, address it then with, uh, with, appropriate, with appropriate sanctions. And again, all of this can be done uh, and should be done not only to tackle the situation in Ukraine and not only uh, for Russian oligarchs, but, uh, but uh, for, uh, for everyone who's been benefited from this secrecy. Um, now, I want to conclude with a question. Would any of this would help, uh, help the war and the horrible situation we're witnessing in Ukraine? At a minimum, it would prevent money being used to fund the war, and that would already be a good thing. Would it swing the outcome of the war? Well, that really depends on how much political power do oligarchs actually have in influencing decisions and Putin's thinking. And I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I also don't need to have an answer to that question, because if these measures uh, have a good enough chance to help the, war, help the war in Ukraine, and at a minimum, they wouldn't do anything to it, uh, but also there are broader good reasons. Uh, that for me amounts to a strong case for urgent and decisive action. And I'm hoping that Western policymakers can be um, as effective and speedy um, as uh, the Ukrainian policymakers, um, as uh, Dr. Bozena has uh, described uh, at the beginning. So hopefully we can take some, some inspiration there and act very quickly on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Julia.